Today we're going to talk about quasi-geostrophic theory. I'm sure that all of you have some sort of idea about what that means, what, what is quasi-geostrophic. You've heard the words before, you've probably seen it in your lectures, but you probably have a fairly vague idea what it is. And uh, today we're going to put that straight, we're going to give you a very clear idea of what quasi-geostrophic theory is. So let's just start, okay, by looking at this weather map. And you can see uh, on this, you can see it's, it's the surface pressure. We have isobars. And everybody knows the wind follows the isobars. And if the wind follows the isobars exactly, that is geostrophic balance, right? And um, the closer together the isobars, the stronger the wind. Now, if the wind is following the isobars exactly, then there's no sense in which these, this pattern is going to be transported or displaced. Okay? So it'll just stay like that. And the wind will go round and round, and it will never change. Okay? So geostrophic balance is a very good way to describe the flow. But if you want to actually predict how the flow is going to change in time, make a weather forecast, then you need something more. Geostrophic balance is not going to give you a weather forecast. So today we're going to talk about the closest thing we can get to geostrophic balance, which also has some extra features, if you like. We're going to talk about small departures from geostrophic balance. So that's why it's called quasi-geostrophic, because it's almost geostrophic, but not quite. Okay? So we'll start by talking about steady departures from geostrophy. Um, so things which still don't develop in time but uh, the effects of nonlinearity and drag, for example. And then we'll talk about ageostrophic flow, the importance of the divergent part of the flow, and a new way of talking about potential vorticity, which we talked about last week. Right? Um, we'll start with the assumption that we're on an F plane, and then we'll generalize to the situation where the planet has some curvature in its surface. Um, and we'll talk about various applications of quasi-geostrophic theory. So that's today's lecture. And quasi-geostrophic theory is very important because it was the basis of the first weather forecasts. That was the equation set which was used to predict the weather. And this, this picture here refers to something called Richardson's Dream. Now, Lewis Fry Richardson was one of the founders of, of meteorology, of the science of meteorology. And he had an idea that we could analyze the equations of motion to predict the weather, but they're so difficult to solve that you need lots of calculations in order to solve them. This is before computers, right? And he had this idea that you could have an amphitheater full of people making calculations. So they're all sitting there with their pencil and paper and their log tables, because they didn't have calculators. They had to use log tables, and they're all calculating away and then passing information from one to another. So this is way ahead of his time. This is a massively parallel um, multi-core cluster which he's got going here in an amphitheater with a guy, you can see he's shining a torch on different parts of the world. It's, uh, so, so he uh, anticipated the idea that we would solve equations by some sort of multitude of calculations. And so what we actually do when we do weather prediction is that we solve partial differential equations by doing many calculations using some sort of discretization of those equations. Um, and we do it, of course, on machines which are capable of doing very many calculations per second. Okay? So, as I said, we'll start by talking about small departures from geostrophy and with um, steady departures from geostrophy. So, Let's just recall the X momentum equation. So du by dt, that's the tendency. Here's the advection term. Here's the Coriolis force, and here's the pressure gradient force. Now, this is in the shallow water set, so the pressure gradient force is the gradient of the thickness of the layer, as we introduced last week. Okay. Um, so on the right here, these, these two terms are geostrophic balance. Right? So pressure gradient force balances the Coriolis force. And then these other terms um, 
We have nonlinear terms and tendencies. So let's just think about the nonlinear terms to start with. Assume it's a steady flow. And they can be represented in a simple way as representing um, centrifugal force. Okay? So here, here's an equation. Coriolis force plus centrifugal force. And when I say centrifugal, I don't mean associated with the rotation of the Earth. I'm talking about local to the flow. Okay? So your, your flow is going around in some sort of cyclonic motion. And associated with that circular motion, there's a centrifugal force. So that's a, something extra compared to geostrophy, right? So we can see how that looks over here. We have, imagine this is a low pressure area, so it's a cyclone. So the pressure force pushes towards the center. It's balanced partly by the Coriolis force, which means the flow is going this way, it's going anti-clockwise, because the Coriolis force is to the right. But since it's spinning around like that, there's also a centrifugal force associated with that. Of course, Coriolis force, centrifugal force, we know they don't really exist, right? They're just fictitious forces associated with our change of reference frame. But if we are in this reference frame and we want to talk about balance, then we'll, we'll say that there's a balance between these, these two fictitious forces and the real pressure gradient force. Okay? Now, since we've got these two forces ganging up to, um, to compensate for the pressure gradient force and keep it flowing parallel to the isobars, that means that the Coriolis force does not need to be quite as strong as if it were in geostrophic balance. Right? So, which means that the flow does not have to be quite so, so fast. So V is a little bit weaker, a bit slower than if it was in geostrophic balance. And so we can express that mathematically here. Um, Fv plus V squared over R is G dH by dr. That's the pressure gradient force, which is positive because we have a low pressure at the center increasing as we go outwards along the radius. Okay, so this term is positive for a cyclone. And that is equal to F times Vg. And Vg is the geostrophic velocity. So that's the velocity it would have if, if it was in geostrophic balance. So we can just eliminate the pressure gradient and we can just talk in terms of the difference between V and Vg, okay? And you can see V is equal to this thing, V times this thing is equal to Vg, this thing is positive so this is greater than 1, so V is slightly weaker than its geostrophic counterpart, okay? Now let's think about a high pressure system. Um, well, it's going around the other way, the, this term here is now negative, Okay, pressure is decreasing as you go out. So the consequence of that is we have a balance between a stronger Coriolis force and the sum of the centrifugal force and the pressure gradient force. And so V is slightly stronger than uh, if it was geostrophic around a high pressure, an anticyclone. Okay. Now, you can group those two things together. You can say that the modulus of V is equal to the modulus of Vg divided by 1 plus or minus, and what is V over FR? It's the Rossby number. So if we're close to geostrophic, V is close to VG because this is small. The Rossby number is small. The full solution of this equation is this, okay? So the solution for V is just a quadratic equation, right? You can solve it. V is, plus, v is equal to minus FR over 2 plus or minus this thing, which is in the square root, okay? Now, as I said, for a cyclone, the uh, pressure gradient is positive because pressure is increasing as you go out. So this term is positive. Right? No problem. Everything under the square root is positive. We can have solutions. There's no limit to the strength of this pressure gradient. If it's an anticyclone, then this term is negative. Right? So if the pressure gradient gets too strong, we don't have solutions. We have a negative square root. So there is a limit. This is the limit, right? dH by dr is less than this thing, um, for which we don't have any solutions, right? Beyond which we don't have any solutions. And that is why there's this limit on the strength of the pressure gradient associated with anticyclones compared to cyclones. And we just look at this weather map we had on the previous page. Here's a cyclone, very intense, very strong pressure gradients. Here's an anticyclone, rather weak pressure gradients, uh, a large kind of flat structure. And it's always like that. It's always like that. And that's a, 
an asymmetry between high and low pressure, which is uh, the result of steady agiostrophic uh, terms. Okay? So that's, the, that's called gradient wind balance. Okay? Just one little aside. You see there's a plus or minus here. Okay? So in theory, it's possible for, to go the wrong way around a cyclone, for example. You, you, you have a low pressure here. You could go clockwise around the low pressure, and there would be a solution with gradient wind balance. Because you'd have, what would you have? You'd have pressure gradient and Coriolis going in, and you'd have centrifugal force going out. It is possible. Uh, mathematically, it, in reality, it's not really possible. You never see it, except on very, very small scales, maybe. Uh, because you have to think about how these systems come into being, right? So, um, imagine we're starting from a state of rest, okay? And I'm, I'm standing here, I'm a parcel of air, right? I've got high pressure behind me, low pressure in front of me, okay? What am I going to do? I'm going to accelerate towards the low pressure, okay? Then what happens? Coriolis force is going to push me off to the right, okay? So, I'm going to go off to the right like this. Low pressure still over there. So eventually, I'm going to end up turning around the low pressure in the right direction, okay? Anticlockwise. So the natural way in which these systems come into being favors the you know, normal solutions rather than these strange anomalous solutions. Um, how about friction? So another way in which you can modify geostrophy in a steady flow is to add some, some drag to the system. So, just imagine a cyclone again, here, the pressure gradient force going to the center, but now we have not only the Coriolis force, but also a drag force, which is in the opposite direction to the flow, okay? And you'd end up with this kind of balance here, so drag and Coriolis force together will balance the pressure gradient force, and the, for that to be possible, the wind has to converge into the, into the cyclone. So this is subgeostrophic flow, it's what you see typically in cyclones. The, I mean, what happens if, if you have wind going in towards the center of a cyclone? Well, gradually you'll accumulate mass in the center of the cyclone and you'll remove the cyclone because you have more air in the center and your low pressure will be eliminated at the surface. But way before that happens, what happens is that you have a low-level flow, which, because this only happens to the low-level fl flow. So if the low-level flow, which experiences this drag, is converging, then it'll naturally give rise to upward motion by conservation of mass, okay? So you'll have ascent in low pressure centers, uh, ascent in cyclones. And that's why if you have cyclonic weather, um, it's always cloudy in, in, the, in, the low, in the depressions. And conversely, it's uh, sunny like today in the, in the anticyclone. We have an anticyclone today. And we have descent because it's the opposite effect. The, you have super geostrophic flow, the, the wind is flowing outwards, and we have downward motion. So downward motion, evaporation, clear skies, upward motion, condensation, clouds. Now, let's just turn that around, because it's kind of fun to look at exactly the same diagram. And we have the same current vector, okay? That's the ocean current, the surface ocean current. And instead of being driven by a pressure gradient force, it's being driven by the surface wind stress. Okay. And this is the stress which is acting on the upper surface of a layer of water, if you like, and it's being pulled back by friction with the water below it. So that's the drag here. Okay. And um, the Coriolis force, again, as usual, is perpendicular to the flow. And so you have the same balance, um, but this is now um, Ekman convergence. So you have a wind stress driving the flow, and it will be convergent. Um, and that will lead to downward motion to conserve mass, and that is Ekman pumping. And this Ekman flow direction, as each layer exerts a stress on the layer below it, so this is the wind stress, then this, the movement of the upper layer will produce a stress on the next layer, so that will then be off to the right of that, and you have the Ekman spiral going down. So um, another modification of, uh, well, that's not really a modification of geostrophy because we don't have a pressure gradient. But what ensues from Ekman dynamics is displacements of the free surface followed by 
pressure gradients followed by general ocean circulation theory, okay, which is not the subject of today. To move away from these kind of examples, if you like, we, we have to put together a system with advection and also time dependence. 